that was a big turning point in our business was when we really gained clarity on who our target audience was. Mm. Because when we started, we were like, we want everyone, everyone, you know, anybody who's got some money to invest, come on in, we'll help you. And we quickly realized, you know, by targeting everyone, we were targeting no one. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hey, real quick before we get started, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us on the show and for listening. Uh, to all my loyal listeners, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, continuing to listen and support the show. If you can go on to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, wherever you listen and subscribe to the show, that would be fantastic. Spread the word too. I'd love to, you know, have this reach more and more people. So if you could share it on social media or, or, or and just talk about it to other people, that would be fantastic. And the last thing is if you can go on to iTunes and give us a rating review, uh, hopefully five stars, that would be great as well. It just helps us spread the word more and it helps us get continue to get uh, really good guests on the show. We've had some fantastic guests and I just want to be able to continue to bring fantastic value to you. Go on to our Facebook page too, Pillars of Wealth Facebook page. And I'd like to hear from, from you as a listener of you know, what you're doing in business, what you've got going on, what you are maybe struggling with or uh, being successful with, and then what we can do on the show to help push you to that next level. Maybe uh, questions we can ask our guests, maybe guests that we can get on the show to talk about certain topics, certain things that are really neat, you're needing uh, some, some extra support with. So provide for us some feedback on Facebook, um, and you can also share this out on, on social media. That would be fantastic as well. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being a, uh, being a either new listener or a loyal listener. I definitely appreciate it. And we will get started with the show. Hey, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexhammer. And with me today, I'm excited to have Annie Dickerson. Annie, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Todd. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. And Annie and I have talked a, a few times and, and really enjoyed conversations. And so I'm excited to have you on the show. So a little bit about Annie. She's the co-founder and managing partner at Good Egg Investments, a company that helps people build passive income through investing in real estate syndications. And to date, Good Egg Investments has co-syndicated over $400 million worth of real estate assets in multifamily, self-storage, and manufactured home parks. Uh, and you guys have been absolutely uh, just crushing it. You also have some education stuff going on, which I'm sure we'll get into as well. So with that said, uh, Annie, can you give our listeners a little bit about your background and kind of how you got to this point of owning a company, Good Egg Investments? Yeah, I'll try, I'll try to keep it short and give you the, the Cliff's Notes version. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's every time anybody says, oh, Annie Dickerson, the real estate investor, it still throws me for a loop because <laughs> never something I set out to do, believe me, um, you know, I started out in teaching. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a teacher, you know, it, you don't make very much. But what happened was on the side, uh, my husband and I just fell into real estate investing, but we didn't think about it as real estate investing at the time. What we did was we bought a duplex and we lived in one unit and we rented it out the other unit. And turns out years later, somebody came up with the term house hacking for it, right? right? So we were house hacking and we didn't know at that time, we didn't know anything about running the numbers. We didn't have any spreadsheets. We had <laughs> none of that. We didn't know what a cap rate was. We barely looked at any of the numbers. We kind of gut checked, you know, could we rent this out and how much could we rent it for? And so we really, that's why I say we really just fell into it. It was nothing we did on purpose. 
Um, and we found through that first duplex, hey, this is pretty profitable. And, you know, we're creating this side income to supplement my teaching income. And, you know, it was, it was great. So we did that a few more times. And, um, but it was always something that we did in the background. It was never like, I'm going to quit my job and focus on investing in duplexes. Um, but as the years went by, um, what happened was I had an opportunity to um, help my husband, who was a realtor at the time, with his website. And in the process of doing so, I learned a lot more about real estate investing. And as soon as I did so, I was like, I need to focus on this. What am I doing working a nine to five job? Holy cow, I need to quit my job right now and get into real estate, which of course didn't happen right away. But um, I then jumped into, you know, let's buy another duplex or let's, let's invest in rental properties. So that's what we started doing because we live in the very expensive Bay Area. Um, and so we started investing in out-of-state rentals. And we quickly learned that that is a whole nother can of worms. It is not like house hacking at all in my experience, especially because we were investing in these developing areas. Yep. And so, you know, were you guys uh, buying turnkey properties or were you buying no. properties and okay. No, they were not turnkey. <laughs> um, we were that we kind of bought them from all over the place. We bought the sure. first one on LoopNet. Hmm. And we were just looking for small multifamilies that would cash flow um, and with some light renovation, but we were sort of handling most of it ourselves together with a property manager. Okay. And so we found it was a lot of work and one thing led to another. And I said, I said to myself, we can't do this anymore. It's too much. It's too much work. It's too much hassle. But then I stumbled into this concept of syndication and passive investing and I thought, this is too good to be true. There's no way I can just put my money in and see passive income without having to do any work. So I dug into that rabbit hole and the further I went, the further I realized that this is a legitimate thing and started to get in, involved in syndications. Cool, yeah. And I find there's a lot of people that really don't understand what real estate syndication is and that you can even do that. And um, they don't know, you know, I mean, as a, an accredited investor or non-accredited investor, they can do it. They don't know the difference. They don't even know what the, that means half the time, um, right. but they don't understand like the nuances and really what they can and can't do. And quite frankly, I was a real estate investor for years before I even knew there was such a thing yeah. as syndication. I was doing a lot of real estate mm -hmm. and I knew you could use private money and I would use private money on my deals, but I didn't really understand syndication and apartment syndication and raising all this money for uh, properties. And then I could invest in them and all kinds of stuff. So, um, very interesting. Is there, it's funny that you say you just like didn't really know what it was and went down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so true, right? It seems like, you know, this black box, you hear this term. The first time I heard the term syndication, I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, Why would right. I invest with other people? I'll just invest myself. <laughs> um, but it, it's true. There's so, it, it seems like the people who are doing it know all about it. And the people who aren't doing it are sort of outsiders trying to figure this whole thing out. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why we, my business partner and I were so passionate because as working moms, you know, we were scouring all the different possibilities to find a way to create some passive income. You know, I opened an Etsy store. I was like, oh, I can do Etsy on the side. That was way too much work. I was like, I could write a book, also too much work, you know, and we had tried private lending and, you know, all these different avenues to try to build a passive income because we just wanted to spend have that flexibility to spend more time with our families because you know your kids are only little for so long right and we didn't want to miss out on that and it's funny that each of us separately before we met we both 
found real estate syndications to be this great path to passive income without having to do much work. You know, you just have to learn on the front end what they're all about. Um, but then there's really not that much work to do. And so that's why we're so passionate about sharing all that we've learned with other people, particularly other um, working moms like ourselves. Cool. So with the, um, you, know, you, you, you just mentioned you've done a lot of different stuff. You've done some house hacking, you've uh, bought smaller multifamilies out of state. Um, so you've experienced and you've done some, some uh, private lending, some hard money lending, private lending. Mm -hmm. So you've experienced different aspects in the real estate industry and, and you've seen uh, what, what your profits look like and what the effort is uh, based on those profits. Well, after you look at all of those models, uh, tell me kind of the difference of your experience of what you've seen on those models, as far as like, what's your time commitment? And then, you know, what's maybe some of the drawbacks and, and challenges of them? Ooh, yeah, I love that. Cause I, I'm seeing, as you're talking about that, I'm seeing the spectrum in my yeah. head where, you know, in, based on, I mean, my personal experience is that the, the out-of-state rentals goes on the lots of work side. Mm -hmm. And the house hacking is sort of in the middle. And, and the reason why I say that, even though we manage our own house hacks, um, we don't have a property manager for those, but it's still less work because it's places that we live in yep, ourselves. You're already there. We're already there mm -hmm. and we're attracting tenants who are like ourselves. Sure. And they know us. They are often friends with us. So they pay on, they tend to pay on time. They tend to let us know if things are not going right, you know, if there's maintenance issues. And so it's actually less work, even though we're managing it ourselves. And then on the low work side, you've got the syndications and the, the private lending. And I would say syndications are even a little bit less work um, because it's, it tends to be the ones that we've done tend to be a little bit longer term. So you sign, kind of put, it, put your money in and forget about it. Whereas the hard money lending, the private lending tends to be a little bit shorter term. So while you get that good money, you get it yeah. back, but then you're like, okay, now I got to go find the next thing, right? Yeah. Um, so syndications in our experience, unless you know something, something even more magical, that's <laughs> syndications have been um, the one thing that we've found to be the best bang for our buck. Well, probably the least amount of work would just be putting yeah. your, uh, putting your cash in the piggy bank, but oh yes, uh, that's yes. not going to make a very good return on investment. Yeah. The yeah. hard money lending, I, I haven't done really, uh, too much of, I've done a little bit of, uh, a little bit of light lending, uh, but the hard money lending is um, the the thing that makes me a little nervous about it. And I know people that do really well in it, uh, but I know some people um, that have to chase some of that money. Mm. I know some people oh, yeah. that have had to do some foreclosures, Ooh. and that that's the one that uh, doesn't interest me as much because it's a little more risk, right? It, it yeah. could. You know, obviously investing in a syndication or really anything, you can still have risk involved. And so the property, you know, could go end up going back to the bank and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But you don't have to file the foreclosure proceedings, uh, right. all that kind right. of stuff. You, you may end up you know, going through a lawsuit or something like that. But, you know, I think as far as multifamily, uh, it's, it's probably the least uh, risky mm -hmm. versus like a flip or something like that. Yeah, I love that you bring that up because, you know, with those three that I mentioned, the um, the out-of-state rentals, the house hacking, and the private lending, you're sort of on your own, right? And it's a scary, scary yeah. thing because if things go wrong, you've got to figure it out. And things have gone terribly wrong for us in some of our rental properties. Um, and so we had to figure that out. Sometimes we had to front the cash to get things fixed. Um, but with a syndication, like you said, you know, if something comes up, you're in a group. So you have that sort of that safety, I guess, of that mm -hmm. group and knowing that somebody else is ultimately responsible for, um, the day-to-day -day operations. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, what's been, what's been the most profitable or maybe you haven't broken it down, but if you have, what's been the most profitable between them? 
Oh, I actually just recently looked at this because I thought, because we still have a, a bunch of rentals and um, we still have a few house hacks and, or a few duplexes, I should say, one that we're house hacking and um, investments in some syndications. And because with that spectrum in mind, I hypothesized, I said, surely if I'm putting more work into the rentals, they should be the most profitable, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> because, you know, I'm putting in work, I should be getting more out of it. And so I put it to the test because I really wanted to know. And so it's hard, you know, when you get the property management statements month to month, you're like, yeah, it seems to be doing okay. Right. So I actually, I took a hard look at it and I compared it to what I was making um, on my syndication investments. And I compared four months worth of uh, my property management statements for just one property, actually one that's doing a little bit better than some of the others. So sort of um, on the, the better cash flow overall. And what I found was kind of shocking to me. Um, and so out of the last four months, two months, we lost money on the property because we had one tenant who wasn't paying and because we're mom and pop owners you know we're not the hard you know i'm the worst landlord i i'll fix things but i'm not the. you know if you tell me that you're gonna pay next week i'll say okay you know i'll give you yeah. a little more time you know you got kids you know don't worry about it yeah and so that's you know, of course that's partly our fault you know so we've lost money the the last two months actually and the two months prior to that um one month we made a couple hundred dollars net cash flow and then one month we made several hundred dollars so like five six hundred dollars okay and when we set out to buy this property you know on paper <laughs> It said that the cash flow was supposed to be several hundred dollars every month. Yeah. And that's what we were banking on. We thought, oh, this is a slam dunk. Yeah. Look at all this buffer that we've created. <laughs> and then the reality of it is, you know, it's not that way every month. You know, some months are great and there's no problems. And some months I get endless calls from my property manager about things going wrong. And that's, that's the main difference between the rentals and the syndications is with the syndications, I don't get any calls. I just get the same check every month. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to think about it. It just comes in stable and regular, which I love. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, I, I, and I try to tell people that is, you know, when you, when you're investing in a syndication, not that things can't go wrong, but um, there's, you know, if you're investing with a strong operator, there's a very good chance that you're going to get close to, if not better than the projected incomes. Mm -hmm. With a property you're going to do yourself, uh, can you do better? Yeah, absolutely. But can you do worse? I'd say yes, pretty easily, uh, mm -hmm. especially if you're new to it. So uh, the smaller properties, that small multifamily, the single families, there's just a lot more kind of in play. And like you said, you lose one tenant and it kind of crushes your cash mm -hmm. flow for two or three, maybe even more. Yeah. Um, you know, and that, and that's like even even when you're investing in like a seven, eight unit building, 10 unit building, you lose one tenant and it might crush mm -hmm. your cash flow for, yeah. for a while. Yeah. And the thing is, people are like, you know, a lot of people say, oh, my rentals, you know, they only take an hour of work a month. And yeah. honestly, if I looked at the, the actual work I put in, yeah, it's probably about an hour a month, let's say. Sure. Um, but, you know, there's all this other stuff, right? Because the moment something goes wrong, that thing is on my mind. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's not necessarily, you know, I have property management who are taking care of it. It's a distraction though. But it distracts yeah. me from the yeah. other things that I'm doing. And then I get all these bills. I've got tax bills on my desk, you know, that I glance over. I'm like, oh, I got to do that. You know, it's just, it 
affects you in different ways that yeah. you don't expect. And I would th- say most of us underestimate the time that yes. we spend on it for sure. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let take take us into now your business journey, mm-hmm. and you know you guys decided, hey, we like syndication, uh, both you and your partner, and now you're going to start working with other sponsors and going to be, you know, raising money for, you know, working with them and partnering with them. And and so take us through that, like trend, you know, that kind of step into that business and how did that work and, and then, uh, you know, where are you going with it? Remember how I said I fell into real estate investing with house hacking? I kind of fell into syndication and and raising capital for these deals. It was, you know, when once I found out about syndications, you know, on the one hand, I had this concept of syndications. On the other hand, I had all this these friends and family who said, hey, let us get in on some of these deals. But hmm. we were doing these duplexes and quadplexes, yeah. and we were like, there's no room. There's no but room then right. with syndications, I was like, hey, I could just lead my own deal. And that's where it started, was I started down that path of learning how to do the underwriting, networking with the brokers, flying out to these different markets. So I started there. I really honestly thought that I would start by just doing my own deal. I didn't need any partners. Surely, you know, I've done these these fourplexes. I could do a 40 unit. No problem. It's the same thing, right? Um, So I started down that path and um, you know, the real estate is a people business. So the, the further I got down that path, you know, I met more and more people and um, somebody said, hey, why don't you, you know, partner with us on a deal? And, you know, you can sort of learn the ropes and maybe you can help to raise some capital for the deal. And I said, wait a second, raise capital for the deal? No, that's the worst part of the whole thing. I'm not going to raise capital for your deal. I mean, why would I want to do that? Um, but you know, it's life is all about taking chances and right. So I was like, okay, fine, fine. I will raise a little bit of capital for your deal. I'd like to see, you know, how you run things. Sure. I'll give it a shot. And in that process, I quickly learned that I actually love talking to investors. And it makes sense, right? Because I I mentioned that I started out as a teacher. um, And you know, you started out as a teacher too. And so, you know, investor relations, investor education is a big part of raising capital. You have to teach people what this black box of syndication is all about, what, how it works, what the process is, what are the risks, what are the returns. And so I found I just loved talking to people about that. And I felt like I was really helping people to learn about this, these opportunities, whether or not they were investing on my deals. And so that's when I sort of shifted focus and I said, okay, maybe I won't do my own deal, but let me focus on um, raising capital and raising awareness about what syndications are. And so at that point, that's when my partner and I met. And funny enough, you know, it's always really hard to find a business partner. I always looked at other people and I thought, how the heck do they find business partners? (laughs) You have to find somebody who you like to work with for years at a time and somebody who will be complimentary to your skill set. And I thought, I'm never going to find somebody like that. And that you can trust. Yes. Yes. That's a big one. The trust factor. And so Julie and I met at a, Um, a real estate investing conference. And we got to talking, I had just quit my job to take this leap of faith into um, doing this real estate thing. And she wanted to quit her job. So we, um, we struck up a conversation about that. And then we didn't, of course, we didn't right then say, hey, let's partner up. Sure. It was months after that, um, where we saw each other a few more times. And then one time we just, um, we got together for coffee and I had spent 
the last couple of weeks um, blogging every day because I just made it a point, you know, I'm going to start a blog. I've got no audience. Nobody's reading my stuff yet. Let me just, just write an article a day just to get it out of my system and figure out what the heck I'm trying to say. And so we got together and I said, you know what? With this whole investor education thing, I really love creating content. I love the videos. I love the blogs. You know, if I could do that all day, I would do that. The one thing that I would take out is meeting and talking with investors. And she said, wait, that's the part I love. And if I could take one thing out, I would take out the blog writing because I sit there for hours in front of a blank screen and I know I should write something, but I can't write anything. And so that, at that point, sort of the light bulb moment went off and we realized, hey, we're trying to help the same people and we have these complementary skill sets. And so we sort of joined forces. But even then, you know, I don't know if a lot of people have gone through that process, it's really hard to form a partnership, yep. any sort of partnership because of that trust. Yep. You have to really figure out who that other person is and you learn more about yourself in the process too. And you go through all this legal stuff and all, you know, it's all outlined, right? If things go wrong, this is what's going to happen. And you really both have to be on board with that. So it was definitely a process. Hey, we're going to take a quick break and I want to mention a few things. First of all, I've been doing some coaching and I want to continue to kind of expand that slowly and, and take on a few clients. And, and up until recently, I didn't really believe uh, in coaching and, and uh, you know, taking courses and stuff like that. But I recently, or I shouldn't say recently, it's been, it's been a, a few years now, hired a, a coach and saw a immediate results and have been very happy with it and decided, you know, as my teaching background, I wanted to do some coaching myself and help other people get the results that I was able to achieve. And so if you're at that point where you think that's the spot for you, or maybe you just want to explore if it's right for you, uh, you know, reach out to me, I'd have a free discovery call with you. We want to make sure that it is the right step for you to take. There might be other things that you can do to get success uh, and coaching might not be it, but let's have that discovery call to find out if that is uh, the step that you need to take. So it can really make a major impact in your business and get you to that next level. Uh, the other thing is John Stiles. He's on this show every single week uh, with me on the Hump Day Hustle. And John Stiles is a real estate agent in, in Minnesota, and he will help you find a good, good investment property. John is very knowledgeable and can help you find an investment property. It can also help you sell your investment property. So reach out to John Stiles with Bridge Realty and uh, connect with him. He'll also, you know, consult with you and, uh, and make sure you guys are the right fit. So uh, give him a call if you're in Minnesota, reach out to him. Uh, he'd love to help as well. Back to the show. So, so now you guys uh, have an education program. Is that, is that kind of from your blogging? What's the, what, yeah. what is the education program kind of done for your business? And, um, where are you going with that? Yeah, great question. So one of the, it, this, this online course that we have, it's called Passive Real Estate Investor Academy. And it was one of the first ideas that we talked about when Julie and I got together. And we said, you know, there's just not a great way to learn about syndications. You know, both of us had started out, we plucked a blog post here and listened to a podcast episode here and read a forum thread there. And it was just, it took a lot of work. It took each of us months and months and investing with um, different mentors and coaches to really figure out what this thing was. And we said, wouldn't it be great if we could offer our investors a one-stop shop where they could get everything that they need, even if they've never had any experience with real estate, a one place that they can get everything they need to invest confidently in their first real estate syndication. 
And so that's really what we built this course around. And it's an online self-paced course. And we go through, you know, multiple deal walkthroughs of real deals that we've done. We talk about all the lingo that you'll need to know to communicate with other people in this space. We talk about the process, the PPM. We go through the PPM in depth. Oh, that you know, sounds all, exciting. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Let me tell you, that was the most fun part, right? That private placement right. memorandum. Right. It was really, really pretty Pretty, yeah, pretty <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I learned a lot, believe me, in going oh, yeah. through that. Um, so yeah, it re it's really the A to Z of everything you need to feel confident going into that first deal. So somebody that's looking to, um, you know, raise some money for a deal, uh, you know, how, how do you actually build your investor list? A lot of people you know, me included, potentially you, I mean, we came as teachers, you know, you don't have a lot of, I didn't have a lot of high net worth people around me. Uh, the yeah. college I went to, the friends that I made there, most of them weren't working really high, you know, paying jobs, mm -hmm. some of them, but most of them not. Um, so then how do you build that investor kind of base, that list where you guys are now able to go out and, and raise money for a lot of different deals? Yeah. Yeah. That's such a great question. And there's so many pieces to that question, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, there's no easy way to do it. You just got to go out and do it. And you know, I, we started out with friends and family. I, a lot of my friends sure. and family are not high net worth individuals, but I talk to them anyway, because, you know, you just got to view that as practice conversations. And mm -hmm. the more that you talk about syndications, the more you yourself will learn about them. You'll learn how to talk about them. You'll learn the questions that people will ask. And then you start to see yourself as a little bit more of an expert. You gain confidence. And then what happens, this funny thing happens when you talk to friends and family and you let them know what you're doing and you say, Hey, can you just help me out? You know, if you're, I, I know you might not be in a place to invest, but do you know anyone who might be interested? And suddenly they're in a position now where they're on your team and they're trying to help you. Yeah. And that just unlocks so many doors because then they start to think through now their Rolodex, right? And they're thinking, oh, you know what? Actually, I do know this person who had been talking about real estate and let me connect you with that person. And so through taking the time to have those conversations and to show the other person, to show your friends and family that you, you really care and you're passionate about what you're doing, then the, you'll be surprised at how quickly your network will start to grow. Yeah. And those are the people who know and, and like you and trust you the most. So especially if you can show a little bit of track record with that, they're, they're going to be the ones that are very eager to help you out and help you grow and introduce you to other people. The new yeah. investors are, you know, people that you just form relationships with are typically the hardest people, obviously, to get mm -hmm. referrals from, especially right away until they do a deal or two or maybe even five with you. Yeah. And then they go, okay, now I trust them. Now I can tell my family and friends about them because right. nobody wants to refer somebody yes. that loses mm -hmm. them money, of course. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Their reputation is on the line. Their reputation's on the line for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what, so beyond friends and family and kind of referrals, is there anything else that you guys have done that you think has is, is really helped uh, with your success? Yeah. You know, one, another great source of leads for us in particular was, you know, we're both working moms and we're trying to help mm -hmm. other working moms. And I think that was a big turning point in our business was when we really gained clarity on who our target audience was. Because mm. when we started, we were like, we want everyone, everyone, you know, anybody who's got some money to invest, come on in, we'll help you. And we quickly realized, you know, by targeting everyone, we were targeting no one. Nobody right. was hearing our message. And so once we pinpointed it down and we said, you know, we really want to help other working moms 
who have a nine to five job are really busy. They've got, you know, we even nailed it down to like this one person, we call her Jen. <laughs> she is our investor avatar. She's, you know, the, who we think about when we write every piece of content, when we have every conversation, we're thinking about Jen, who's this working mom. She's, you know, she's, Gone, gone, climbed the corporate ladder, but she's finding that she doesn't have very much time to spend with her children. And she's got all this stuff she wants to do. She's got her yoga pants sitting in her closet that she never gets to wear because she never gets to go to yoga class, you know? So we really thought through who is this target audience? Who is this target person that we want to aim all of our efforts toward? And so through that lens, we've been able to reach out, you know, we've been, um, uh, we've done a lot of online networking through different moms groups. So been able to reach other moms, um, in person, mom events, mom conferences, you know, just, it, it has given us a fresh way to think about, you know, how, where do we find the people who might be interested in what we're providing? And also it has changed um, the look of our marketing and our branding so that we're making sure that everything is targeted towards that person. Wow. That's, I, I really like that because a lot of people do that where, where you started, how you started out, where they're just targeting like everybody. They yeah. just want everybody to become their investor because, well, well, why would we want to limit it, right? I mean, yeah. if, I've got, if I've got, you know, millions of people to choose from, why wouldn't I choose from a, millions of people versus just a few hundred, you know, mm -hmm. few, few hundred people or a thousand people? Yeah. You know, that doesn't make any sense, what a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. but, you nailed it where you've got your target audience. You're very specific, even naming, you know, a person and really defining who that person is. Um, now you can actually speak to that audience where mm -hmm. every time you speak to them, they are feeling connected to you. They're mm -hmm. feeling like, okay, they already know me. Um, and I think they know you then a lot quicker. They feel comfortable around you probably a lot quicker than if you were just speaking to everybody uh, would you get some investors? Sure, you, you still would, but it's going to take a lot longer to get that relationship built and get people to feel comfortable around you. Yeah. So I really like that. That's uh, fantastic advice. Yeah. And the funny thing is, even though we target moms, we still get dads. We still get men yeah, who want to sure. invest. We still get people who don't have kids and they approach us and they say, well, you, we really like what you're doing. We want to get involved. And so it's not like by by honing down on your target audience that you will actually cut everybody else out. Yeah. yeah. So right. that's the the main fear, right? So we've actually found the opposite to be true. Cool. Um, so with with your with your company, a growing company, give us some advice about operating your business successfully, especially like a partnership. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that makes our partnership work so well is that we don't get in each other's way mm. because we are so different, yet we get along really well. And that's just such a hard thing to find, right? And so, whereas Julie does all of the investor relations and she talks to all the investors, she does all of the, when we raise money for a deal, she handles all of that paperwork um, and all those emails. And then I'm over here in my education corner and I'm doing the blogs, the videos, the newsletters, the online presence, um, and creating that course. And so we're really, even though we're very well connected to each other in this business, we're very, we're doing very different things. Yep. And so I think if, if you're running a business, if you can clearly define your roles and responsibilities, that will that will benefit you in so many ways because in in the early days julie and I, there would be things when julie and i were like oh let's do that together okay okay yeah and then it would be like when i worked uh, in corporate you know you have to call a meeting right okay here's the latest iteration let's take a look at it what's your feedback what's my feedback and let's incorporate that let's let's iterate on that and come together again 
and it just completely slows down the process. Yep. And so if you can find somebody that you trust to really take the reins and run with it, then you'll be able to grow that much faster. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I think every partnership that I talk to, it's very similar where they say that you have to have very defined you know, goals and objectives for each person. It's not, mm -hmm. you can't be doing the same thing. You can't overlap. And that's part of, you know, my first partnership that I had is we didn't have that definition. We mm -hmm. both tried to do a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. And it, it was a struggle because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was like, who's doing what? We don't know who's right. doing what. And right. we're both doing the same thing. And I show up at the property to check on the property and they say, well, you know, the other, my partner, mm -hmm. well, they, you know, they just left and you're going, Oh, you know, yeah. it's like, so you're slowing everything down yeah. where mm -hmm. if you had a clear defined goal, you know, clear process, it just would have been so much more smooth. So definitely Absolutely. agree with that. Uh, what's a mistake that, you know, you or, or you guys as a, uh, um, you know, company have made and how did you learn from it? Ooh, that is a really good question. Um, hmm. Or even early that. on before the partnership. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've I, made at least yeah. one mistake. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've made lots of mistakes. <laughs> I'm just trying to pick one. Uh, um, yeah. So I think um, I think going back to the target audience idea. I mean, that's sort of a theme. Mm -hmm. When you're starting a business, you know you start broad, right? You start with these big goals and that's what we did. We thought, oh, we can do everything ourselves. You know, we can do all the emails, we can do all the marketing, we can do all the social media. We don't need anybody. That's just, you know, that's costing us money if we hire out those things. And so we try to do everything all together. And yep. so simultaneously, because we were building these relationships and partnerships, we then were raising money for multiple deals and also building up our systems, building up our business, and it just became way too much. And so a few months into our business, we had to just say, okay, let's take a break. Let's figure this out because there's things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing, mm -hmm. that somebody else can be doing on our behalf that yes, it will cost us a little bit of money, but it'll save us way more time and headaches. And so I think that's one mistake that we made uh, early on is yeah. we tried to keep all the reins, everything for ourselves, tried to control everything. And um, now that we've brought in people to help us on different aspects, you know, it's been fantastic. Every day there's a social media post that goes out and I don't have to do the work of scheduling it, of writing it, of creating the, the media for it, but it's out there. Yeah. And so through doing, making this little investment, you know, we're able to serve our investors so much better than we could if we were just doing everything on our own. Awesome. Yeah. And, and good for you guys for learning that early on because a lot of people, it takes them years or decades to learn that <laughs> until yeah. they finally decide they've had enough. Yeah. And the, the process of finding people and freelancers, you know, that's a skill in and of itself, mm -hmm. learning to talk to communicate with people, manage people, to give feedback to people, to have patience and to, you know, build systems yourself so that you're able to bring them in at the right time. You know, that's all a process. And so if anybody out there is listening and hasn't started that process, just give yourself some, some slack, you know, that, you know, that it's, it might take some time to get to a point where you're really comfortable with uh, that, but, but in the end, it will benefit your business. So how did you find, you know, people to work uh, for you guys in your business? So was it uh, going on, you know, doing postings? Is it local people? Is it, uh, you know, VAs? How did you guys find them? And, you know, your trial and error with that? Yeah. So, um, we tried a few different platforms 
and uh, asked around, you know, we tried to see what, who other people were using, how they were finding people and resources. And um, ultimately one, one resource that we found to be really helpful for us is called Free Up, F R E with three E's, F R E E E up. <laughs> Um, cause everybody's gotta be clever, you know, Yeah, yeah. they throw yeah. the extra E in there for free. Right. Um, <laughs> no. uh, free up, um, is like, it's, it's like Upwork and those other platforms, sure. Fiverr, you know, um, the main difference we found is that, um, free up will, whereas on Upwork, anybody can go and, um, they can offer their services free up um, actually goes through and interviews and vets all those people before they join the the platform okay and so all of the people when i put out a posting i know that all those people have been pre-screened and so we've been able to find some really good people on there cool awesome um so tell us about uh, good egg and what you guys are doing moving forward, where you see the future of the company going. Yeah. So over the last year, our heads have completely been spinning the whole year doing all these deals and building up our business and building these systems and trying to figure out our target audience, all of these things, you know, it's been a lot. And thankfully, you know, we're at a point in our business where we've been able to help a lot of people and now we've got a healthy investor base of people who are on board with what we're doing, are excited to be involved, excited to tell their friends, and now we're ready for the next thing. And for us, that's a couple of things. On the, on the investor side, um, we are looking to do our own solo deal. So that is the next thing on the books for us. Um, so it's, it's kind of come full circle, right? I never intended to go this route, you know, but yeah. it kind of worked out for us because we were able to focus first on building our investor base. And now that we have that investor base, now we can focus on doing the deals. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's our focus on that side. And then on the education side, you know, we're going to continue to grow our resources for our um, passive investors. We're going to write a book here soon. Um, and, you know, we just like to continue to serve um, our passive investors however we can through those online courses, through in-person meetups, um, and through all the resources that we can create for them. Cool. Awesome. Um Two more questions before we wrap up. Okay. One is, what's your favorite book? Of all time? That is like well, the hardest Business question. preferably. <laughs> but. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, okay, gosh, this is a hard one too. Um, I've read so many. I'm just trying to think through. Um, hmm. Well, one I, I almost always, when you, when you, people ask me about my favorite book, I almost always go with the last one. And so this one is um, 10X by Grant Cardone, which okay. I'm currently rereading. And I love um, the 10X mindset. It's just, you know, before I heard about the 10X mindset, I just, I thought it was just about, oh, well, if you're going to go after a hundred, just change that to a thousand and right. you'll be good. You know, good. I'm like, that's lame. Like, wh what does that change? You know, you're still yeah. going to put in the same amount of effort, but now I realize it's, it, it changes everything, yeah. right? By changing that goal, you change your entire mindset, you change all of your energy, all of your efforts. And so it completely is, it changes the game. And yeah. so I love that book 10 X by Grant Cardone. Cool. Cool. So very last question is yes. what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Ooh, three pillars of wealth creation. Okay, here we go. So first, um, invest, for, uh, gro invest for growth. I think that's something that we're always looking at. The potential for something to not only be cash flowing or a good investment now, but the potential for growth in the future. 
Um, another pillar for wealth, actually, I guess, th this is family. You know, for me, it's family. It's not just me and my husband doing this, but bringing our kids into this. I think that's such a big part of wealth creation and that intergenerational wealth creation is bringing in your kids to everything that you're doing and sharing that. Um, so that's been a pillar of wealth for us too. And then the third one is just paying it forward. You know, it's amazing the dividends you'll get when you share what you've learned with other people yeah, in an honest sure. and genuine way. You know, I'm never afraid to tell people I made mistakes. I've lost money. Here's what you can learn for it, from it. Here's how you can benefit and not make those same mistakes. And it's amazing when you put that goodwill out, how much you'll get back in return. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, okay. So I, I said last question, but I got one more question. All right. All right, Todd. Only for you, though. <laughs> <laughs> How do our listeners get in touch with you? You can email me anytime at Annie at goodegginvestments.com. And if okay. you ever want to learn more about us, we're at goodegginvestments.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Annie, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. I had a lot of fun, learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure our listeners did too. So I definitely appreciate the time. Of course. Thanks so much for having me, Todd. You have a fantastic rest of the day. You too. A hey, special thanks to Annie Dickerson. I appreciate her joining us on the show and uh, she's just doing great things. Always fun to talk to Annie. A couple of things I took from this episode. First of all, she talks about raising money and when you're raising money for any business, for real estate, whatever it is, uh, she talks about having a target audience, making sure that you have a very specific target audience. If you can, of course, attract capital from other people, but by having a very specific target market, market, you're going to have a lot better luck at attracting more people. Um, and people that are very uh, attracted to your deals. Uh, that goes with any kind of marketing, uh, any kind of sales. We always want to have a target market. Uh, next thing she talks about is, is don't be, don't try to be in control of just way too much. Uh, a lot of us want to control kind of everything. And it, that just ends up in being the worst result. Um, we can maybe handle it for a short period of time with a little bit of growth, but then as things get, you know, bigger and, and your business gets bigger, of course, uh, trying to control too much, just is never a good thing. The last thing she talks about is, and one of her pillars is invest for growth in the future, invest for appreciation. And, uh, you know, cash flow is very, very important. And I don't think Annie's discounting that, but also make sure that your assets are going to have future appreciation. It's not just a one sided investment. So, fantastic advice from Annie as always. And again, appreciate her being on the show. Thanks for listening. Thanks for checking out uh, Pillars of Wealth Creation. I hope you enjoyed this episode and all of our episodes. Go on to iTunes if you haven't already. Subscribe. Give us a rating review. We'd love to hear from you. And then uh, our Facebook page. Go on to Facebook if you haven't done so already. And uh, check out Pillars of Wealth Creation there. You can make comments to us. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know uh, what kind of questions you have or what kind of guests that you want on the show as well. Uh, thanks for listening. Have a fantastic rest of the day. And hey, make every day a Saturday. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. A couple things before we go again. Go on to our Facebook page, Pillars of Wealth. We'd love to have you on there. Go on to iTunes, give us a rating and review and subscribe to the show. Also, um, you know, don't forget, reach out to me if you want any help with uh, potentially growing your business and reach out to John Styles to help you buy or sell real estate. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it. Have a fantastic the rest of the day. And as I say, make every day a Saturday. <laughs>